Hello everyone, we're going to do damage text today and we're going to start here with a new scene for the damage text. It's just going to be a node 2D uh, control and a label. The controls that way you could have uh, something else in here, images or whatever if you wanted to and you could position or resize and it would get everything. So in the label it's just some placeholder text, obvious reasons there. Um, you do probably want to have the horizontal and vertical, at least the horizontal alignment set to center. That way it doesn't get biased one way or the other. And I do set this position in the scene so that it's centered on the origin here. Because that, uh, that way it, it might default to like here, for example, but you don't want that because then it's going to, this is going to be the position. And if that's the position of your character, it's going to look off to the side and weird. We don't want that. So other than that, you just want to add the Final Fantasy VI font or whatever font you want to, just as usual, and set the uh, size down here. So let's have a look at the script. What we're going to do is have a script on the root node. Make sure it's on the root node or it will cause a few issues. So we have an amount property, which is just going to store, you guessed it, the amount of damage or healing to be done. And then we're going to get the control node object here, and then its child, which is our label. And then we're going to set that label's text to whatever the amount is uh, to a string because the amount's going to be an integer. So the way this is actually going to work is this node gets instantiated, or the scene rather, as a child of the character or enemy that it's going to be affecting. And then it'll already be in the position of that character or enemy. And this is just debugging. So the original position is just where we're starting there. And we want it to bounce twice. So this original position keeps the kind of floor position in a variable so we can go back down to it. Um, high apex and low apex are just the tops of each of those bounces. I'm just setting that to a Y position that's such and such off of the original in each case and that can be adjusted. So if you're not familiar with tweens, all it's really doing, first you just need to create the tween object which is all this is doing. And then we take that tween and tween property. All that's going to do is tween a property of an object. So you feed it the object, in this case our control node. The position is the property that it's going to be changing. We're going to go from wherever it is now to whatever you put in here. So this is the first bounce, the high apex, and then how long it's going to take to get there. Ease type out will slow down as you approach that end value. And so if you're coming to the top of a bounce, that made kind of sense. Uh, transition type, this is exponential. These are just different factors you can play with that affect uh, like how fast, like it speeds up, slows down, just variations in how it gets there essentially. So chain is just what it sounds like. So you take that same object and chain. So after this first one completes, we're going to do the same object position, go back down to the floor, take 0.23 seconds to do it and then back up to the low apex and you know same ease type as the first bounce and then we're going to go back to the bottom and like transition type bounce is not necessarily great like what you would think but uh, again these can just be played with and that will that'll create our little double bounce so after the bounce is finished um, this tween callback is going to call a method after the tween is completed so what's important is if you follow this syntax is just this part right here this open close parentheses and this lambda operator that's basically creating an anonymous function so you don't have to like write the function separately but you could um, all we're going to do is q free which is pops it out of the scene it makes it go away uh, and this set delay you can do at any of these tween steps if you wanted but here after we're finished we're going to wait one second before it actually does the q free because we want the damage text to bounce and then stay there a moment. We don't want it to just disappear instantly on us. So I'm going to show how you would instantiate that. And if you're just looking to do damage text, this will give you the basics that you need to create da damage text. After I show that, I'm going to go through a couple of tweaks I made from the previous tutorial's code if you're following along with that. Because I need to separate enemy and character selection better than I did in that one. So this battle algorithm script is where I'm storing this stuff. I figure, you know, you can do any calculations you want. Right now, the value is just hard-coded. So right here, this uh, damage text method that gets called from down here. I, I will go over these when I go over those code changes, by the way, just so it's clear why I have these two. But the essential for populating the uh, damage text is right here. So the damage text object is just going to be that scene that we created, the damage heal text scene. We're going to instantiate that scene. And then we're going to set the amount equal to whatever damage you feed in here. 
And this is the part that will screw up if you don't have the script on the root node of the scene. I've tried getting the child that didn't didn't like me. So, And then the parent object, this will be your character enemy. You add the child that's that damaged text object. So then once it's instantiated, then it's going to go through this ready method and then make itself go away at the end like we just went through. So I'm going to show that now, but if you uh, are following from my previous tutorials, uh, just stick with me after that because I have a few changes to update on that. Come on. Attack me if you will. Someone attack me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so again, it's only implemented on the fight right now. So, and again, I did not do the uh, battle animation yet. So what we'll see here, bounce, bounce. I can keep doing this all day because I haven't implemented more than that, but that's what it looks like. Um, I also implemented it on character. So if you want to do this, it's just a different hard coded value. And you see it's a little too high here. And I think that's because the origin on my characters is set here. I think I should just change that. So the origin is at their feet. Um, so yes, suicidal. But hey, there there it works. Okay, so now let me go over the code changes from the project. So if you're again, if you're just after damage text, um, that may be all you need. Uh, but I do want to go over this for anyone following it. So the character and enemy selecting target states, I've separated those out. Uh, you know, except for like jump and tool, which never target a uh, party member. So I still have the selecting object states, which includes both of these. So um, you'll see where that comes into play and selecting character states and selecting enemy states separately. So that way, again, the if statement can check for them without being a pain every time. So before I had this characters and enemies list right here, I commented that out. It's just the list of the two, node 2D. That way the cursor could easily just go around both of them without me having to do work. Um, but you know, karma. This I think was already here. I was storing the uh, character and enemy objects, and those are the ones we get from the uh, LightDB database where we have their stats. So if we want to actually do some calculations, we're going to need that. I had character objects because I was doing stuff with that before, but I don't think I had enemy objects separately. These are the node 2Ds. Those are going to come into play when the cursor is pointing to each of those objects. So again, the difference here in the character spawn area, this is where I did do the characters and enemies before. Um, now it's just going into its own list, which is right here. So the character object is going to add that in here. And this is not going to get the enemies when we spawn those. That's going to go into a separate list of that right here. So again, we're not going to characters and enemies. We're just going to add the enemy object to enemy objects. And we'll, those are all going to be public static variables up at the top here because that way we can access them from the hand cursor or the other uh, script if we need to, and I need to. So the hand cursor, uh, again, just all we're doing really is creating those separations. So this object selection, before I just had left and right in here, and that was just cycling through everything. Now it's going to have up and down, which is still gonna call target previous and target next. Um, the only difference is those methods are going to implement the battle state and separate whether it's touching the uh, character or the enemy objects. Uh, so before I check those out, this one is left and right. This is going to be for switching between character and enemy selection. And this one would get really messy to put all the different states in here. So what I did is in the, uh, excuse me, not EMs, in the globals, this dictionary down here is to serve that purpose. This is going to take in a game state and it's going to return a game state depending on what you feed it. So all this is really doing is, is for any state that's targeting characters, it's going to give you the same state targeting enemies and vice versa. So that's all that list is really doing. So what we're going to do here is set the game state to whatever that dictionary returns, therefore the quote unquote opposite game state in order to move to selecting characters or to selecting enemies depending on which one we're currently on. So this update game state, I added battle just to separate it. It's the same method as I used last time. Uh, we're going to set it to globals selecting state opposites, which is that dictionary, and then globals game state, which is going to be whatever the current game state is. So once we've done that, that's going to set it to targeting whatever characters or targeting whatever enemies. So if we go down to target next here, uh, we're going to see the. this is where I separate that. So we're checking the game state. You know, Again, this is only the battle selecting enemy states, only the battle selecting character states. Uh, we're, and this is the same logic as before, except 
for here. We're not doing characters and enemies anymore. We're just doing enemy objects depending on these states and character objects depending on those states. So over here, um, where we set those states, uh, so like if we're in the magic menu, meaning where they're actually selecting a spell. So again, if the magic class is white, then we can set it to the target the characters. Otherwise, we can set it to the enemies. You know, that can be more detailed, obviously. So that way, we also have a way to control where that cursor starts and, it, you know, so that it makes some sense. And I'll show that quick as well. All right, well, we're up to uh, Tina because she has magic. And you'll see here your white magic. So yeah, here it's going to select her by default. We can also move it with left or right. And you'll see up here the battle state that I'm debugging will switch accordingly. We can still go back. And here I'll pick a black magic. And yeah, it starts on the poor Rhino Tour. And you know, these. So when we're switching back and forth between these states here, this is where it's using that dictionary and looking up the opposing state. So this is the newer code and this is what we saw work when we actually saw the damage text populate. So this is how this is going to work. So for the fight states, I just did that for now. Uh, we're going to get the selected target, which is going to get the characters array. Again, that's the one with the database objects that has their stats so we could use to calculate things based on. Uh, so we're going to use the hand cursor get cursor index method. And then for the battle algorithms fight, which is the method here. So to be clear about what we're passing in here. We've got the active character index, which is the character who's performing the action. So if Tina was casting magic, for example, here we get the character with the active character index and the node 2D with the same index. That's the one performing the action. And then if they were performing the action on another character or themselves, um, you base the index on the hand cursor index, which will give you the target. And otherwise, if it's an enemy targeting, we're going to do very similarly, same thing with the characters, except now we're going to use the enemies array or enemies list for whatever index the hand cursor is pointing at. And the same with the objects. So we get both of those. So in the battle algorithms, um, this is where we handle both of those situations right here. Yeah, so this is an uh, overload. If you're not familiar with overloads in C Sharp, um, it's having the same method name. You do it just like this. So if you want to have the same method, but you want to pass it different types of objects, you need to have that method again with the same name and then just put the signature for whatever you need it to be. So in this case, we needed to take in the enemies as these second two arguments. And in this case, we need the character. So as long as what you pass in matches one of these sets of arguments, then everything will be fine. And again, I didn't actually do calculations here, but this gives us the ability to. So we can cover that in the future as well. Like we pass in the fighter here. This is the database object that's going to have all the stats on it. And then, you know, similarly for everything else, this is the node 2D where we can animate or we can do what we need to do with them.